You know, climate change is not about changing temperature. It's about changing people's lives. It's about changing communities, and it could potentially be about changing whole civilizations. Three years ago, Jared Diamond published his book, Collapse, a book that tries to distill a unified theory of why societies fail or succeed. Looking at a range of civilizations from Easter Island to Mayan Empire to the Vikings and Inuit in Greenland and to various modern day societies, he identifies five factors that contribute to collapse, climate change, hostile neighbors, trade partners, environmental problems, and finally, a society's response to its environmental problems. The first four may or may not prove significant in each history society's demise, but the important point, of course, is that a society's response to environmental problems is completely within our control, which is not always true of the other factors. In other words, a society can choose to fail or to succeed. We have the capacity to determine our future. We we can choose to fail or we can choose to succeed. The path's not easy, but the path is there and we will hear about it tonight. It's attainable. We have the capacity to take that path to make the radical and transformative shifts in both thinking and action that can determine whether this society and other societies around the world will succeed. But to do this, we need a revolutionary plan, a plan that shifts our thinking in radical ways a plan that moves us towards new ways of approaching the way we exist on this earth. And tonight, we'll focus on this alternative plan, Plan B. And we'll hear from it from a man who has spent his life looking after our collective futures. Lester Brown has books that have lined my bookshelves for the 15 years I've been here at Catawba. Many around the world, including the Washington Post, consider him one of the world's most influential thinkers. In May 2001, he founded and now serves as president of the Earth Policy Institute, an institute that works to provide both a vision and roadmap for an environmentally sustainable economy. Brown has an MS in Agricultural Economics from University of Maryland and an MPA from Harvard University. And in 1964, he became and advisor to Secretary of Agriculture, Orville Freeman, on foreign agricultural policy. At the beginning of 1969, he left government to help establish the Overseas Development Council. And in 1974, he founded the World Watch Institute, uh, and in 1984, launched the State of the World Reports, and they've been translated into some 30 languages. Awarded some 22 honorary degrees, he is also a former MacArthur Fellow and recipient of many prizes and awards, including the 1987 United Nations Environment Prize and the 1989 Worldwide Fund for Nature Gold Medal. I've got to spend the day with him. He's a wonderful person. He's just like any of us. So I'd like you to welcome Lester Brown. Thank you very much, John. Earlier today, I was trying to recall how I got here. And I couldn't remember a specific letter of invitation. And I began to sense it was a conspiracy of some sort. <laughs> and I've identified, I think, at least some of the conspirators. They include Fred Stanback, Gene and Foster Owen, John Ware, and there may be other conspirators I've not yet identified, but this is the result of a conspiracy. And for better or worse, they're the ones responsible for this evening. <clears throat> I enjoyed the introduction, John, and appreciated the fact that you didn't do what the late Senator Paul Simon did many years ago when he was introducing me. He held up the latest book I'd written and said, Lester's written the sort of book that once you put it down, you can't pick it up again. <laughs> <laughs> a 
while, while we're on books, um, some of you, I see a bit of uh, gray hair out here, will remember the name Liz Carpenter. Liz was Mrs. Lyndon Johnson's social secretary and was a very talented woman, one of the best public speakers I've ever listened to and, and a good writer. She did some of LBJ's better speeches. But after the White House years, she wrote a book called Ruffles and Flourishes. And she went to, uh, she found herself one night in a hotel lobby in Atlanta where by chance she ran into her former White House colleague, Arthur Schlesinger. And Arthur said, uh, gee, Liz, that was a great book of yours. I really enjoyed it. Who wrote it for you? <laughs> she said, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Arthur. Who read it to you? <laughs> and you thought Washington wasn't fun. Uh, <laughs> Late last summer, as we were completing the research and writing of Plan B 3.0, there was a raft of stories on ice melting. You may remember some of them. One uh, reported that in one week, an area of Arctic sea ice the size of the UK had disappeared. And scientists were stunned by this. They hadn't seen anything quite like it before. And then a few weeks later, there was a report from a team of scientists studying um, one of the glacial outflows from the Greenland ice sheet. As you know, Greenland is covered with a huge ice sheet. It's about a mile thick. Um, and then there are various outflows um, from that ice sheet. These glacial outflows um, uh, move the, the ice um, from the continent into the Atlantic Ocean as more and more snow accumulates more ice on top each year. And what was interesting here, more than interesting, it was shocking, is that the rate of glacial flow, which traditionally is 100 meters a year or maybe 200 meters a year in various glacial outflows around the world, here this glacier, the Aluasat Glacier, a mile wide, sorry, three miles wide and a mile thick, was flowing at two meters an hour. I mean, you could literally see it moving. And apparently the ice melting on the surface of the ice sheet was working its way down through the glacier and the water was flowing under the glacier to the, to the ocean and lubricating the flow of the, the glacier. So with this flow of two meters an hour, periodically large chunks would break off and, and slide into into the ocean. And when that happened, given the size of this, weighing billions of tons, there would be literally a seismic response, a mini earthquake as billions of tons of pressure were suddenly uh, released um, from, the, from the land. Again, scientists had never seen anything like this before. 